couple of weeks ago, October 31st, we celebrated the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. It was on October 31st, 1517, that Martin Luther posted his 95 theses against indulgences on the door of the Castle Church in Wittenberg, igniting a firestorm which set, swept through church and state. I began my ministry as a Lutheran pastor, as I hinted at in Sabbath school presentation, and there is a longer story there. But because of this part of my background, this anniversary was especially important to me. And my wife and I were back in DC for our North American Division year-end meetings. Lots of long meetings, just think conference constituency meeting that goes longer and longer and longer. So we took a little break and we went up to Gettysburg where I went to seminary. And they were celebrating it in big Lutheran fashion. It was at Gettysburg Lutheran Seminary that I was first commissioned as a chaplain candidate in the Army Reserve way back in 1986. So there was a lot of memories that were brought back by this trip. At the heart of Luther's protest was his personal encounter with the gospel. The question was this, how do we find peace with God? Is it through works or spiritual disciplines? Is it following man-made rules? And Luther said no. It is solely by believing the gospel that we are forgiven freely when we believe that Christ bore our sins on Calvary's tree. Of all the messages that I as a chaplain preach to soldiers and to veterans, I think this is the most important. It's the message of Paul in our scripture, which I will reread. Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. This was one of the passages that helped Luther to discover the gospel. He wrestled for years with what he called anfechtum, spiritual anxiety or attacks or trials, it could be translated. And it was in the gospel that he discovered peace. Luther knew he wasn't alone. He knew that soldiers wrestled as well with spiritual anxiety and trials. In 1525, he wrote a little booklet called Whether Soldiers Too Can Be Saved. He wrote the book to answer some questions that were asked of him by a knight, Asha von Kram. It was a tense time. There's a lot of anxiety all through Europe. War seemed inevitable. Those princes of those territories that followed the Reformation were threatened by Catholic princes, and both were threatened by invasion from the Turks. And many soldiers questioned their roles because there were also the Anabaptists who were saying Christians should have nothing to do with the military, should not wear mustaches that remind you of the military, should not wear big brass buttons that remind you of the military, but instead Christians should withdraw completely and not vote, not serve as police, not be, serve as judges, not have anything to do. Come out of her, my people, they believed and took that very seriously. So Luther wrote in his tract, some soldiers have doubts. Others have so completely given themselves up for lost that they no longer even ask questions about God and they throw both their souls and their consciences to the winds. I myself have heard some of them say that if they thought too much about these problems, they would never be able to go to war again. And he adds, one would think that war was such an absorbing matter that they were unable to think about God in their souls. 
Actually, however, we ought to think most about God and our souls when we are in danger of death. The old saying, there are no atheists in foxholes, bringing about, touching the same point. Now in this pamphlet, Luther's main task was addressing the anxiety related to whether Christians could even put on a uniform. So he focused on upholding the legitimacy of the profession. He referred to John the Baptist when some soldiers there in the crowd came to John the Baptist and said, what can we do? And he didn't tell them take off their uniforms. He didn't tell them leave the military, but he said, stop complaining about your pay, something that soldiers still have not learned. He said, don't defraud people, don't be violent to people, but do your duty honorably. So Luther, in this pamphlet, repeats those biblical texts, and he repeats the basic principles of the just war theory, telling von Kram that the only just wars are those defensive ones, not those where a prince simply wants to expand his territory. It is when a country is attacked, Luther reiterates, what had been Christian teaching for a thousand years, then it is that a ruler has an obligation to protect his people from the enemy's attack. But he cautioned, you ought not to think that that justifies anything you do and plunge headlong into battle. That does not give you God's guarantee that you will win. Indeed, such confidence may result in your defeat, even though you have a just cause for fighting the war. For God cannot endure such pride. Rather, God wants to be feared, and he wants to hear us sing from our hearts a song like this, Dear Lord, you see that I have to go to war, though I would rather not. I do not trust, however, in the justice of my cause, but in your grace and mercy. For I know that if I were to rely on the justness of my cause and were confident because of it, you would rightly let me fall as one whose fall was just because I relied upon my being right and not upon your sheer grace and kindness. So he would say to a nation, don't get cocky. Just because you've done great in the past, just because you were attacked, does not mean you have the right to fight a war any way that you think or to imagine that God is on your side. You must always come before God in humility. This was Luther's response to so many of our crises and our qualms. Have faith in God. It isn't about you. It isn't about your strength. It isn't about your knowledge, all of which can be swept aside in an instant. And then what will you do? In your darkness, in your despair, in your doubt, are you going to rest upon your own abilities and your strengths and your skills, weak and frail as they are, or will you cling to God's mercy and trust in his strength? Some soldiers have doubts. Luther wrote, and that hasn't changed over the past 500 years. There are soldiers and airmen and marines and sailors and coasties who have doubts today. There are soldiers and veterans who have given up, who do not think that they can think, to God, think of God, who do not think they can pray to God. There are soldiers and veterans today who are broken, who are hurting. You may have heard the number that there is an average of 20 veterans a day who die by suicide. In the past 16 years of war, more service members have died by suicide than have died in combat. This past year, this past couple of weeks ago at our North American Division year-end meetings, our secretary, Alex Bryant, put out the numbers that about 37,000 People joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church in North America through baptism or profession of faith last year, 37,000. Well, in that same time, there were 45,000 in America who died by suicide. There are more people who die in car accidents in Texas than, get, than join the Seventh-day Adventist Church each year. These are the things that we need to look at before we start boasting of numbers. What is our impact on the world when more people would rather die by suicide than who join our church? 
This is the thing that I wrestle with as a minister to veterans, and I'm chaplain, I've been chaplain for my VFW post, for the American Legion post, for a number of other veterans organizations besides in the unit that I just left, 3,500 infantry soldiers spread across Texas in the Texas National Guard. And suicide was the biggest issue that I dealt with. I had 10 years from 1986 to 96. I did not have a single soldier that I counseled who was thinking about suicide in those 10 years. I had one soldier who died by suicide, a young Abenaki Indian in northern Vermont. But in the past eight years, since I got back in in 2009, this has become one of the most biggest focuses of my ministry. First two weeks of this year, I had three soldiers in one battalion in the Rio Grande Valley who died by suicide. And the commanders and the senior NCOs came to me and said, Chaplain, why? How can we as a battalion have three successful combat deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan where we all come home with CIBs, combat infantrymen badges, we come back with purple hearts with, and with uh, bronze stars for valor, we bring every single person home only to lose them to suicide after suicide after suicide or car accident or murder. Many veterans bear scars. Some are visible. The missing legs, the missing eyes, the missing arms. But many are invisible. Post-traumatic stress disorder is one, but stress disorders are a, a spectrum. We all come back affected by the stress of combat in one way or another. Traumatic brain injury, we're learning so much more about concussions. We've learned about them in football, how repeated small concussions can cause lasting damage, and we see the same thing in combat, IED blasts or rollovers, things that don't seem to have an immediate impact can have long-term invisible damage. But there's another term we've been using more recently that you might not be familiar with, the term moral injury. A psychiatrist, Jonathan Shea, coined the term back in 1994 in his book Achilles in Vietnam to talk about the disillusionment that comes when you no longer believe in the cause or are discouraged by the actions of those who are leading you and you wonder whether your sacrifice was worth it. Others have expanded the concept of moral injury to refer to the guilt or shame that comes from knowing you did something was wrong or you failed to do something that was right. I talked about this with the members of my VFW post and they, I said, now do you understand that what they're saying, that there are some things like PTSD that are more fear and anxiety based, based on things that happened to you as opposed to the guilt and shame from things that you've done and they all say, oh yeah, we can understand that. My World War II vets, my Korean vets, my Vietnam vets that I serve. Sometimes there's some overlap, but they all know there's a difference between these things. Term moral injury may be new, but the feelings are familiar with soldiers of every era. The NCO who feels responsible for the young private on point who walked into the ambush. The one person in a vehicle who survived an IED blast on a road in Baghdad. The soldier who knows that a buddy committed a sexual assault yet said nothing. The veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan who have fought over the same ground, over the same city blocks, over the same village time and time and time again for 15 years. And now the children of those first veterans are now going as soldiers and fighting battles on the same ground that their fathers and mothers fought battles on. Now we know how the Vietnam vets felt. Is a statement I've heard from a number of my young soldiers today. A whole industry has built, been built up around treating PTSD and moral injury. Books, conferences, retreats, new drugs, new therapies, some urge veterans to take refuge in such practices as yoga and Native American sweat lodges. Others suggest art, music, equine therapy, 
Some recommend modern versions of ancient pilgrimages or penance to work out the stress and physical exertion to pay back a debt through giving to others. And some do find peace through doing some of these things. Similar things have been used over the centuries by warriors of many faiths, many cultures as a way to get rid of the nightmares and to cleanse the soul. In the medieval period, soldiers returning from battle sometimes went on pilgrimages to the Holy Land or to Santiago de Compostela in northern Spain. Or they joined penitential orders wearing sackcloth and ashes and devoting themselves to serving the poor. A famous example was Francesco de Bernadone, who came back from a war with his neighboring village, came back from a time as a prisoner of war. Broken by that experience, he gathered other combat veterans around him, and they dressed in simple clothes, they renounced violence, and they served all in humility. You may be more familiar with him by the name of St. Francis of Assisi. Now, Luther wasn't a soldier, but he tried similar paths like those to ease his own spiritual suffering and to find a gracious God, and he found all of these recommended things lacking. He joined the Augustinian monastery. He punished his body through harsh fasting and whipping his bare back to show his sorrow to God. He took the dirtiest jobs in the monastery to show his humility. He prayed the liturgy of the hours. He tried the path of the mystics and contemplative prayer and meditation. He went on pilgrimage to Rome and he crawled on his knees up a stone staircase said to have been the one that in Pilate's palace that Jesus went up. But none of these things brought peace to his soul. Nothing that is until he heard and believed the good news of the gospel. And the gospel transformed him and sparked the movement that became known as Protestantism. It was a movement founded on a simple idea stated this way in the Augsburg Confession of 1530. We receive forgiveness of sin and become righteous before God by grace for Christ's sake through faith when we believe that Christ suffered for us and that for his sake our sin is forgiven and righteousness and eternal life are given to us. We sometimes misunderstand that. We sometimes think of justification as an intellectual kind of thing, a doctrinal teaching about something that happened in our past or our ticket to get into the heavenly gates in the future. But for Luther, justification is and remains a living reality. It is the core experience of the Christian because we still get tempted. We get tempted to sin and we get tempted to doubt. The past comes back to haunt us. Our feelings of anxiety, frustration, fear, self-loathing, guilt, shame, all of these things can still plague us, which is why justification is by faith. It isn't about works, it isn't about feelings, it is about whether we will believe the good news that Jesus Christ speaks to us of the forgiveness of sins. Ellen White put it this way in Steps to Christ, page 51. Do not wait to feel that you are made whole, but say, I believe it, it is so, not because I feel it, but because God has promised. Some might say, well, I believed and I was fine for a while. I felt like I was on top of the world. I felt such peace and then the doubts returned. And that's why I say that for Luther, justification was not a one-time thing. He said we need to hear that word of promise again and again and again, and we need to cling to it and hold fast onto it. We, remember to need, we need to remember, especially those times, that we heard that word of forgiveness spoken to us directly. And Luther pointed to two. One was when we were baptized. And we hear the word of promise that Jesus said, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, Mark 16, 16. Not that it's something magical. But baptism, Luther said, is a kind of a visible word. It's a way that the word of the gospel is presented to us in a way that we can see, that we can feel, that we can grasp onto. 
So he said, to appreciate and use baptism aright, we must draw strength and comfort from it when our sins or conscience oppress us, and we must retort and say back to the devil, but I am baptized, and I know that I have the promise in Jesus of eternal life. Some Adventists, and I underscore this point, because some Adventists treat baptism as something that you need to do again and again and again every time you feel sorry for your sins. Have you felt, have you heard that? If you've ever been to a youth revival, you have. Some evangelists push the practice of rebaptism, especially in our youth. And I have seen people who say, tell me they've been baptized three, four, five, six, seven times before they got 25. Our church manual warns against rebaptism for emotional reasons or every time you have a revival. It cheapens baptism. So what our official teaching is, is the same as what Luther said. If, you experience, if your experience grows cold, then what you do is repent. You have revival. You believe again what was said to you. You turn around and get going again. Instead of going to baptism, you go to communion. That's the second place where Luther saw the gospel preached in a tangible way, where we see the word of promise in something that we can touch, bread that is broken with the words, this is my body given for you, a cup that is shared with the words for you for the forgiveness of sins. This is what justification is for Luther, believing that word when it is spoken to you so directly and plainly, grasping that bread, and believing that promise is meant for you. If we believed that, communion would not be the Sabbath where we have the smallest crowds in our church. It would be the time when people come to hear and to grasp and to hold on to that promise given here. Compare this with Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 659. The communion service was not to be a season of sorrowing. This was not its purpose. As the Lord's disciples gather around his table, they are not to remember and lament their shortcomings. They are not to dwell upon their past religious experience, whether that experience has been elevating or depressing. They are not to recall the differences between them and their brethren. The preparatory service has embraced all of this. You know, in early Adventism, they didn't always have the foot washing service at the same time or on the same day as the breaking of the bread. That was a service that was focused just to focus on the call to repentance so that when you came together to share the bread and the wine, you were there to rejoice. Sister Wright continued, the self-examination, the confession of sin, the reconciling of differences has all been done. Now they come to meet with Christ. They're not to stand in the shadow of the cross, but in its saving light. They are to open the soul to the bright beams of the Son of Righteousness, with hearts cleansed by Christ's most precious blood, in full consciousness of his presence, although unseen, they are to hear his words, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth give I unto you. Justification is not a doctrine or a calculation of how we measure out the difference between justification and sanctification. That's how some of the folks that I heard as a college student back in the 80s, speaking with Australian accents, sometimes made justification to seem. It was all some intellectual thing. But for Luther, it is about the power of the forgiveness, the word of forgiveness spoken to you in your trial and in your doubt that gives you peace with God. We don't get beyond justification. We don't get to the point where we don't need to hear the gospel because we forget, we doubt, we have emotional swings, and so we need the preached word. We need hymns that remind us of the gospel. We need to remember our baptism when we get our feet washed. We need the communion service because, as Luther put it, the promise of the gospel cannot be beaten into our ears enough or too much. That leads to the old question, does that mean we don't grow? Does it mean there's no place for sanctification? Not at all, it happens. It happens slowly, sometimes so slowly we don't see. It's like seed grown in the ground in the winter. Luther used this illustration. All winter long, it's a, quote, 
a dead, moldy, decaying thing covered with frost and snow. But under that covering, something's working. And new life has taken root. And it is sprouting and it is growing. Faith and hope assure us that there is something alive. And it will be fully revealed in God's good time. This sense of hope is what we need today as soldiers and as veterans when we think back on our experience, when we remember the loss of friends, when we remember the trauma that we have seen, when we cry out in despair, wondering whether our sacrifice, our time away from home, whether that was worth it, when we remember things that we did or failed to do on the battlefield, there is only one thing that will give us peace of mind. There is only one thing which washes away the past and gives us hope for the future. And that one thing is the gospel of Jesus Christ. I turn you back to Paul's words. And I hope you come out to our Sabbath school to study this book of Romans this quarter. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. May that peace of God, which passes all understanding, comfort your hearts and your minds through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.